the mythical sergeant major always lurking emerging only when hands are in pockets when soldiers are walking on grass or a safety brief needs to be given sergeant majors only exist in our army today to take care of soldiers and their families do you feel soldiers today are softer than when you joined did you ever get an article 15 i try to take that leadership role to ensure that the things that happened along my career that were truly negative do not happen under my watch what's the dumbest thing you ever did as a specialist sergeant major should always make sure that he's focusing on what non-commissioned officers are supposed to be doing i'd go up against anybody whenever they want and crush their souls open door policies exist for this kind of reason over the last 10 years i've educated myself and i love what i do welcome to kill tank radio i am command sergeant major burke the regimental sergeant major for second cavalry regiment In today's podcast, we are going to address a topic that I think will be very important to all of our listeners. And the question is, is what the hell does a SAR major do? The goal of this podcast is to communicate to the formation in a fun way what SAR majors actually do. We will ask questions provided by soldiers across 2CR. Some we actually had a little bit of a read ahead on so we could, you know, kind of prep a little bit of notes. But the rest... We have not been given yet, and we will be put on the spot to answer. What are we trying to accomplish here? What are we really trying to do? Doctrine, and I'm not going to bore everybody with it, but, uh, you know, we pulled up ADP. What does a command sergeant major do? He assists the commander. He is important for providing the leadership and the expertise to the units on critical locations and times uh, during missions. I didn't read it verbatim because that's not the point of this. The point is, is to actually hear from your SAR majors what SAR majors do, what they feel their role is, and the impact they have on their organizations. So with that being said, I will let everybody introduce themselves and talk a little bit about it. Pioneer 7, uh, Command Sergeant Major Pedraza from the Regimental Engineer Squadron. I enlisted way back in July 1998. Actually, October 97 into the delayed entry program uh, when I was still 17. Uh, both of those as a uh, combat engineer uh, initially. I'll pass it on to the next person. Hey, I'm Command Sergeant Major Allen, Mule Skinner 7. I'm from a small town, Union Springs, Alabama. Two grocery stores, four traffic lights. Have one bar. <laughs> Two grocery stores. <laughs> yeah. right, and four right. traffic lights. All right. No Piggly bar. Wigglies. Small town. No. Piggly Wiggly <laughs> nice. and Big Bear. All right, all Those right, were the two. Enough. Okay. I enlisted June of 1996. I came in the Army as a 77 Fox, which transitioned to a 92 Fox. Reclassed 10 years after that to a 92 Alpha. Currently a 92 Zulu and the senior rank enlisted logistician for 2CR. 77 Fox. That is correct. What is that? Petroleum <laughs> Supply Special. <laughs> All right, Sergeant Major Rose. Uh, I'm Command Sergeant Major Dan Rose. I enlisted in uh, also in July 1998. I am an 11 Bravo, now 11 Zulu, uh, from a small town in Idaho. Graduated with 18 people, so very small town. Yeah, I'm seeing um, a lot of small towns. Okay. Sergeant Major Guerrero. Hey, good evening. Um, Command Sergeant Major Guerrero. What if they're listening in the morning? Uh, that's true. So good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're at. <laughs> I am Command Sergeant Major Frank Manuel Guerrero III. Um, I hail from the harbor area of Los Angeles, California. I enlisted in the United States Army 15 July 1998 as a 19 Delta Cavalry Scout. <laughs> Your GT score has got to be a little high. <laughs> to with that. Uh, uh, I am the CSM for 4 Squadron, 2nd Cavalry Regiment. My call sign is Sabre 7. All right, thank you. Sergeant Major Pedrasa, how many deployments do you have? I, I deployed to uh, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq twice, and uh, did a uh, RAF deployment to Africa as well. So like five? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Sergeant Major. Alan? Two Iraq, one Afghanistan, Kosovo, peacekeeping. Okay. And Sergeant Major Rose? I did uh, three to Afghanistan, one to Iraq, and I went to Kuwait for nine months. Not a real deployment. Yeah. <laughs> and Sergeant Major Guerrero? I have two. One uh, Iraq, OF-1, and the other one Afghanistan, OEF-10. So the reason I wanted to kind of highlight that is because first, when you just talk about years in service, so, you know, just in this room alone, you know, you take it five times 20, you know, you have 100 years of experience in the United States Army. 
Uh, you take the deployment, five, 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 five. You're adding almost 20 years of combat time overseas. That is a lot of experience. That is a lot of experience in one room. So this should be a uh, pretty fun. We're gonna try to keep it low key, uh, keep it exciting. Uh, I will start. I'm gonna answer my own question that I have put in front of me. Why can't we walk on the grass? That was one of the questions. Okay, dragoons, walk on all the grass. Okay, if you see grass, I want you to walk on it. Grass and sidewalks, they're meant for walking. They're meant for dragging sleds. That is a myth that we are going to get rid of, okay? All grass is open for walking. Who wants to start? All right, so I got the first question. So Major Pedraza here uh, from a private asking, what advice do you have for a new private who just arrived here? Seek a positive mentor. Okay, positive mentor. Why do you say that? Because mentorship, everyone needs it, whether they believe it or not. Okay. And so there's good mentors and not so good mentors. And so you want to search for a positive mentor that's going to lead you down the correct path. What, what do you think is uh, some ways that you can vet, so to speak, your mentor? Make sure you're picking the right person because you don't want to pick the wrong NCO or the wrong leader. I think you're looking for you're looking for somebody who's successful, okay. to be honest. Um, <clears throat> and when you find that guy who's successful, he probably knows the steps that you need to take to uh, make it to the next level. And as long as you're following what that guy says, then you you should probably be successful. Anybody else? I know when I first came in, uh, someone mentioned to me, as Sergeant Major Allen mentioned, find a mentor. And what they said, what my leader told me, was make sure it's outside of the organization, preferably. No one says no when someone approaches them and, and asks them, hey, you look like a successful person. Would you mind being my mentor in the future? In the military, the institution we belong to, it, it strokes the ego and makes that leader feel a little bit more wanted and desired. You don't want a mentor that's just going to tell you exactly what you want to hear or a mentor that's not going to say, hey, listen, man, you're messing that up. And, you know, here's what you need to do to correct that. Somebody that actually challenges you. So I think a mentor, that is a great point, Sergeant Major Allen. Anybody else advice for a new soldier arriving to 2CR? So when you look for a mentor, one, uh, a lot of people talk about first impressions. I think first impressions is, is a big deal, right? So we look for a good order and discipline in the organization. I mean, what's the first impression of that? You look at soldiers being at work on time. Yeah. You look at cleanliness. You, you know, all the little small things that show that individual that you're selecting is moving in the right direction, the direction of success. We talked about that. I'll, I'll throw one more thing on. Uh, you know, you definitely need to have somebody that you can, in and out of work, that you can bounce ideas off of. Literally, when I was walking over here uh, to, to, to hop in the booth, I passed a, a PFC. Do you know what this young PFC was driving? A brand new yellow Camaro. Z71, is that right? Is that right? Z71, Camaro? that's yeah. a Z71. Yeah. Fast car. Yep. It's, it's creme de la creme for yep. Camaros. Yeah. Not a wise choice. Not a wise choice. When you talk about mentorship, you talk about leadership and everything else. As a, as a new soldier, you want to make sure that you know you don't find yourself in a in a bad position. You're setting yourself up financially, professionally, all these different kind of things in the wrong way. Well, to counter that, I would say we need to get to know our soldiers. Oh, fair. Okay. So, supposedly, the soldier came from a wealthy family and a wealthy background. Well, maybe. No, you're right. No, you're you're right. Maybe maybe I was judging as I was walking by, but we've I, all, think, oh. I think that just comes based on the background we grew up in yeah, because right. our pay scale was a lot lower back then. So, yeah. you know, some of us couldn't afford cars like that, but it's understandable. You got to get to know the individual before we make assumptions. Because I was an E4 with a Camaro. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, all right. Yeah, I got it. I'm going to ask that one. I got gotcha. you. There's a, there's a good question. That'll be a good segue for that. So any kind of other advice we would give to new soldiers outside of the mentorship the piece? See, that's Star Majors. Typical Star Majors sitting here beating a point to, to that. I, I, would, I would just add to uh, that something that helped me out, that I lost focus. When I first came, it wasn't until I became a sergeant that I remembered why I joined in the first place. Oh. So sticking to your plan, every, all of us had a reason to join the military. Right. Mine, as an example, was education. And I had spent three and a half, four years initially 
doing a lot of crazy things that were not part of my plan. So when, when I got back onto my plan, I saw that the rest of my career, everything else started falling into place uh, when I got back onto my plan. So I'm ready to realize, did you have something you want yeah, to Yeah, I, I was just going to say, so, I'm something to watch out for when you when you first get here is falling into that group that oh, is going yeah. out uh, every weekend yep. and drinking way too much. Um, so I think you can fall into that group when you first get here. And once you fall into that group, I think you lose that focus that you're talking about. Uh, but, you know, on what Sergeant Major Rose is talking about right there, find that group that is the adventurers. You know, life's about memories, you know, at the end of the day. That's all you got. You got, you know, just a collection of memories. You're not going to remember the clubs. You're not going to remember the parties. Maybe some, but most you're not going to remember. And you sure in the heck you're not going to create good memories with all the money you spend in those kind of places. You know, and I've, I've heard soldiers say, well, I'm a private. I can't travel. That is not true. You find those people that know how to travel Europe, you can do it at a very low cost between the trains, the hostels, hotels, you know, Airbnb, Ryanair, all this different kind of stuff. You can absolutely do it. Find that group. I think that's an important thing of those people that go around and actually travel the, travel the world because people save their entire lives to, to come do what we can do in 45 minutes once COVID is obviously our we're going to transition and this is a pretty this is a pretty funny question what was the first thing you bought when you got that sergeant major money i uh bought a bike my uh oldest son crashed my bike so bad like a motorcycle or a pedal bike a pedal bike a pedal bike and i mean it's a it's a cannondale it's a very nice bike i, I had everything else uh, i have all the our family has all the basics through uh years of, of getting paid uh, pretty well but that's what it was for me uh, later on, it was a car, but it wasn't the first thing that, that I bought. Anybody else? Nothing. Yeah, I mean, I hate to say it. The first thing I did was I went to my financial advisor. Oh, God. And like you said, it's a huge jump. The huge jump comes later in the career. So, you know, when you're looking at what's coming in possibly five years, maybe 10 years, um, I went to my financial advisor and tried to figure out how I was going to invest all this money. I bought a Harley Davidson. <laughs> you did? Harley? What kind of Harley? Uh, I have a deluxe. Deluxe, wow. Yeah. It's big time. Road and that's just because I had one in the past. Um, I had a Heritage Softail um, that I fixed up. And then I was stationed at Fort Bliss, went to the academy, sold my, my Harley Davidson, got orders back to Hawaii, and I was like, well, I need another motorcycle. So I bought another Harley Davidson. Nice. Is it in Hawaii still? It still is in Hawaii because I've customized it so much, I refuse to change it to uh, abide by the German oh, standards. Oh, yeah, yeah. You probably have to change a bunch of stuff. Oh, no, that stinks. Okay. Yeah, well, mine's super boring. <laughs> super boring. I bought, like, a fancy, fancy European coffee maker. <laughs> Are you, uh, like, espresso machine? Yeah, it makes espresso you, and cappuccinos you know, and all this stuff, my, man. My wife, to this day, requests espresso fancy uh, coffee machine because of what, what you said just now i'm gonna not allow her to, to listen to this because uh, <laughs> no i mean mine was super uh super super kind of lame but i love coffee and uh, i drink coffee every day so and my wife's a big coffee drinker too cappuccinos and lattes and that's what we bought all right so what other kind of questions we got what do you got interesting question that a sergeant posed why don't we have more or days rather than training on MRT and suicide prevention? I think it'd be uh, better for morale and building relationships than sitting in a classroom. What do you guys think about that? COVID-19. <laughs> COVID-19 <laughs> cannot be a response to everything. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. And I think uh, there's actually some demonstrations and some squadrons that have done a great job at that. Despite popular belief, the Army does not have these programs to waste soldiers' time. They are looking at a solution to try to kind of fix a problem. So when we talk about resiliency training, for instance, it's because the Army recognized that, you know, soldiers were having resiliency issues, which was leading to other things. What it takes is, is uh, to be more a little bit more specific, uh, I, I agree. And it's not that we don't have those ideas. What the problem really is, is it's always about, you know, when you're a SAR major, you know, even quite frankly, as a first SAR is bandwidth. You don't have time to, you know, sit there and kind of plan all this stuff out. If we have young sergeants, staff sergeants, and even soldiers 
that say, hey, I have this idea. I've done my homework. We can execute this type of training in this kind of environment and meet these kind of fundamental tasks. Then, you know, that leader is probably going to look at it and go, boom, let's do this. Let's make this happen. Awesome. Yes, mm-hmm. Yeah, with uh, Sergeant Major Burke, just a comment to help out the, the sergeant that asked this question. You have to start learning the, the words. And uh, one, lear- one word here for the day is uh, high payoff training events. Yeah, there we go. And so when, when you can pitch that term to your leaders and say, this event incorporated with us, with this other event snowball into a high payoff uh, training event, you're going to get buy-in from all your leaders to do this uh, high-speed training uh, like it sounds that you want. All right, so what other kind of questions we got? Do you play Call of Duty? Would you be willing to play against any of your soldiers in a pro-am session? No, I don't play Call of Duty. I haven't played video games since, like, <laughs> Duck Hunt. I don't have the hand and eye coordination for video games. In my house, we play with the Nintendo Switch, and so my uh, Smash Bros. Uh, skills and my uh, Mario Kart skills are way up there. Uh, I uh, I'd go up against anybody whenever they want and crush their souls. I do not play video games either. However, I never balk a challenge. I will always accept it. Uh, my son, Xbox, yeah, right, Xbox One. Xbox he has one. Xbox One. Yep. He plays Call of Duty. I will absolutely hop on his gaming console. I will show you what's up. You will probably mop the floor with me because I have no idea how to how to play it, but I'll figure <laughs> it out. I do have another question, and we we're actually going to try to segue into this one. What's the dumbest thing you ever did as a specialist? For me, it was every 40. So uh, every 40, we did something uh, super long road trips. Uh, my first duty station when I was a specialist, it was Fort Bragg. One of the longest road trips, we went to uh, Houston for a four-day weekend. If anyone's driven from North Carolina to Houston. Holy crap. It's uh, it's about 22 hours straight. It was pretty dumb because we got back at 6.15, driving all, all night, uh, keeping each other awake, right into PT. And, of course, our uh, first sergeant saw what we did, had already questioned us about it. So he ran the troop about 12 miles uh, to make us pay for it. And then he... Uh, told the story to the rest of the company and they all hated us for like four months <laughs> <laughs> okay i drove to tijuana and ate tacos don't ever eat the tacos in tijuana from a street <laughs> vendor at two o'clock in the morning i disagree with that <laughs> no it was a long road trip back i'll save you the gory details uh but uh it took us a while to drive from tijuana back to jblm we did have a pass though to long. jblm yeah. no 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 that's 24 hours straight. <laughs> we had a pass. Back in the day when we had pot belly stoves. Okay. I would take the uh, fuel can from my first arms commander's tent while they were sleeping. And they would freeze out. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I hope the first arm commander listened to this and they That's right. remember that. That's right. I'm trying to think. I mean, most of mine are probably rated too hard for I mean, oh. yeah i mean i did i did a lot of i did a lot of stupid stuff when i was uh when i was young and it all had to do with alcohol i mean that probably leads to why i don't drink now a days but i think probably the dumbest thing i did was drink moonshine i didn't know what it would do probably took 48 hours for me to uh not be drunk anymore so it went down real easy and it uh Stayed in there for way too long. <laughs> so, Major Guerrero? I can't remember that far back. Oh, <laughs> man. I think that's it. I've His version of pleading the I've fifth. Been, I've been sitting here thinking of when I was a specialist, and I, I know I was in Fort Polk, Louisiana, and I was in 1st Squadron, 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment, and that's about it. I that's, don't uh, that's our major equivalent to I plead the fifth. That's right. That's right. <laughs> However... I do have a good segue because you brought up Sergeant uh, Major Pedraza about how you got back from a long drive and you went straight into a 12 mile run. From my experience, when I was put in situations like that, it right. sucked, but we executed. So in saying that, I have a question from a PFC that says, do you feel soldiers today are softer than when you joined? I, I don't think so. I, I think the soldiers uh, today just need to work out their lives the same that I did. I, I mentioned to you guys at the beginning, I joined when I was 17. I did my basic AIT and airborne school all while I was 17. I didn't know anything about being mature. I didn't know any better. As you said, we just executed. 
it took me three, four years to figure out who I was. But no, I don't think they're softer than, than I was. Uh, matter of fact, I think all of my soldiers in the Regimental Engineer Squadron are much smarter and more capable than I was in 1998. I mean, when we joined the Army, guess what I heard as a private? This generation, these kids nowadays, oh, they just don't know. They're not tough. They're not, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like that always, that's existed probably, you know, since the beginning of time, especially probably in the Army. And uh, I just say that every generation is different. And this current generation, they're smarter. You know, just like Sergeant Major Guerrero said, hey, Private Guerrero, do this. He didn't dare ask why. He wasn't even thinking of asking why. He just executed no matter how dumb it sounded. Nowadays, they're thinking through the problem set. They're applying critical thinking. Part of it is because of the information that's available. When we were growing up, how did you find anything out? You asked your parents, you asked your friends, or you went to the library if you happened to have one. You know, Sir Major Allen did not have a library in his, you know, when he, his small town. <laughs> we had a library. <laughs> oh, you did have a library. We did have a library. All right, good. People you know. at the Piggly and, Wiggly and we, do. And we, and we had encyclopedias also. Yeah. You know, or yeah, encyclopedias. Britannica. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Well, nowadays, if you have a question, you can find 3.2 million answers to that question in 0 0.03 seconds with Google. The flip side of that is us as leaders is it holds us more accountable. We can't just say, well, because I said so. We've got to make sure that we got our ducks in a row as well as leaders because we know that if we tell them something, they can very easily Google it and prove us wrong and, be, and we're going to be like, oh, man. you know. So we've got to actually be smarter. So it actually raises the, the game of play for everybody in the Army. But I definitely don't think they're, they're softer. Um, it's just different. Yeah, and I think uh, older people have a hard time internalizing yeah. or saying, what am I doing to cause this? So if they have oh, a problem yeah. with their soldiers, they want to blame those guys oh, yeah. right away instead of thinking, you know, because that's what I think about the whole generational gap. When I see soldiers that are doing things that I wouldn't have done, I think maybe it's the leadership that they have that's different than the leadership that I had. Yeah. Maybe I'm not or maybe we're not as good a leaders as the leaders that I came up with. And so oh, if we internalized and thought that way, maybe we think different about that next generation. So, you know, you're talking about emotion, emotional intelligence, Roger. you know, as a leader. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a completely hypothetical situation. Uh, but, you know, there was a Sergeant Major, a Brigade Sergeant Major, that actually, you know, he had a meeting uh, you know, in the last 24 hours. And, uh, you know, he sent out the, you know, he sent out the calendar invite and he said, Hey, Sergeant Majors, you know, meet me here at this time. Uh, so we can sit down and we could talk about a couple things. And, uh, Sergeant Majors, uh, some of them didn't show up, uh, to said meeting. And Sergeant Majors first reaction was obviously, you know, like you were talking about Sergeant Major Rose, you know, after a pause, some reflection, you know, the, the real point was, is, yeah, okay, I probably wasn't clear. Um, I didn't say, hey, I really need to see all of you. We need to talk about X, Y, and Z. But the ability to do that is difficult, and that comes, that comes with maturity. I think that's, a, that's an important lesson, you know, and there's, a, there's some great, great stuff out there that talks about emotional intelligence. All right, Sergeant Major Rose, you get to ask a question. Absolutely. Yeah, so I was going to this, – this one segues actually pretty good in the okay. emotional intelligence conversation. Uh, and it comes from a specialist, and it says, if a soldier gets punished and fulfills the punishment, why are they being targeted and scrutinized more? I'll take that one. Oh, uh, boy. I think... Uh, Must have been for the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great question. It, I do think that it's important for all of us to recognize that we're people as well. I would say to that soldier, whatever your infraction was, late for PT, disobeying an order... Etc. Etc. Yeah, yeah. DUI. You lost the trust and respect of your leader. So if you just take that idea and recognize that you were disrespected and lost the trust of a person, think about what it would take for for someone to gain your respect or your trust when you gave it freely to them, and you and they lost it from you. Well, I would tell you, it's, we talk about two different things. You're talking about trust, and the question is about punishment. And yeah. this more along the, the lines of a reprisal, pretty much. So if the soldier has been punished for what he's done or she's done, 
and completed their extra duties, so forth and so on, then if you continue to target, then that's a reprisal. So I'll offer something up, you know, kind of from the my seat and what I see. I think just like Sergeant Major Allen said, I think we're talking about two different things. When the punishment is over, okay, then you know that soldier, as far as punishment goes, it's complete, it's done. You know, so if the reprisals happen, and i.e., hey, somebody go get me PFC Rose, he's still on my shit list. I'm gonna put him on detail. That's reprisal. You know, focusing on that soldier because they once got in trouble. You know, that would be you know some kind of reprisal. <clears throat> However, with Sergeant Major Pedrosa's point. Listen, we're all human, and if Rose did X, it's going to be hard for me to forget that. And I think we try to hit reset, but it's always going to be in the back of our mind. You know, it's it's kind of like a liar. But somebody lies to you, and you find out they lie to you, it's difficult to believe them after that. Right. You know, so if a soldier gets in trouble, and you see them associated with something that's maybe not okay or not within the standards, sorry, we're human. You're going to look at Rose. So what I would say also specifically to this, was it a specialist? Or yeah, it was. Okay. You know, the other thing that sold, everybody has rights. Okay. Um, and I've had soldiers come up and do open doors with me and say, hey, I want to be transferred. I want to be transferred to another organization. And most of the time we support that. There's been very few rehabilitational transfers the RCO and I have not supported. Um, and quite frankly, they can even come up and ask you as squadron, uh, you know, squadron CSMs as well. If they feel, you know, just maybe moving within the squadron will be enough. You know, we all make mistakes, but if you truly feel like you just can't get back on track as hard as you try because of that leadership's bias, their open door policies exist for this kind of reason. Yeah, I think sometimes it works the other way as well. So when somebody messes up mm. and is recovering from it they're recovering people look at them and say man that guy has really overcome oh, and so yeah, they'll yeah. overlook other people because this guy's overcome adversity i think there's a little bit of unfairness that happens on that uh side of the coin too frankie you're sitting over there awful quiet so i think for this we have to understand that this is a business and sometimes you got to separate yourself from the business you got to separate your personal feelings Targeting, I don't agree with it. You shouldn't be targeted for anything, right? right? Any reason. So looking at it, one infraction, I mean, just based on how I operate, when I sit on, when I sit in with the commander for uh, Article 15s or any type of UCMJ actions, honestly, as soon as we walk out the door, I understand, you know, he's going to go or she's going to go through the punishment phase. You still continue to move forward as a soldier, allowing that, op that opportunity to learn from your mistake and get better. But as we look at it and we look at trends across the regiment, a lot of our issues are reoccurring from individuals. It'll be the same individuals and then coming up with, hey, I'm being targeted. If you're creating a trend because you're, you're constantly messing up, I think you're painting a target on your own self. I don't think it's, it's necessarily leadership targeting you. I think it's you not taking accountability for your actions yep. and painting that target on yourself. And like Sergeant Major Berg says, it, soldiers have right. There's services you can talk to if you feel. We have open door policies, all that to eliminate targeting of soldiers. So I got I got another question. That, it's pretty personal from PV2, and it asks, did you ever get an Article 15? Oh, yeah. I'll start with that one. All right. I did. So that's why I'm telling you this target thing is, is not right because somebody actually gave me a second chance and didn't target me or label me for one mistake. I was a private, I was hanging around with the wrong crowd, and I got caught for underage drinking, received a summarized Article 15, and since then, I decided I would never hang around folks like that again, and I looked forward and never looked back. Yeah, I received one, it was self-inflicted. I was in Honduras uh, back in 98, and they had this thing where you could only use the telephone for 30 minutes at a time a week. Uh -huh. And I was on the telephone for about three hours. Oh boy! And that's just the way it happens. Got an article fifteen for that? Yes. Mm. I I've only been late one time in my career. That's it. It did not result in a in an article fifteen. When you drove back? Well, yeah. Houston. Was that last week? <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, yeah. That's right. It was yeah. the, the story that Charlie Jabir said was hypothetical. <laughs> Technically, you weren't late because you were there a week early. That's right. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. that's right. Yeah, and he didn't carry it over. Okay. So no. I I haven't had an Article 15. I did get a letter of reprimand when I was a E5 for not following SOP, and it was uh, where I was locking and clearing my guys when we were coming back in a fob, and a serious incident happened. You know, 
it was actually a 50 cal that was shot off in camp. No, I never had an Article 50, never had a letter of concern or reprimand that I can remember. Other questions? Yeah, what's your personal bench press record? My personal bench press record? Uh, 385. For me, it was uh, 350, I believe. And during the deployment, all I was doing was rock clearance, uh, finding IDs or getting blown up. And other than that, working out twice a day, so... So I used I used to rep two seventy five for ten. I've never tried to do a one rep max on bench press. So two seventy five is as heavy as I've ever lifted. That's still impressive for ten. That's not bad, Frankie. So three eighty six, and that's just because you did three eighty five. Oh man, somebody go give me a bench press. We're gonna do this right now. We're gonna solve this right now. No, I think I tried one time to lift like. 300. I think I did it like five times. Sergeant Major Allen said his uh, bench press was for record. What was that record? 405. Anyone uh, feel froggy? Want to wanna get a 406 in there? <laughs> Son of a... I give up. <laughs> but I was in the 400 power lifting team for like six years, so... All right. How did you stay motivated to have a long career like you've had? You know, I talk about, you know, first part of my career where I was ready to get out. You know, I was done the first three years. Uh, but what has come about, you know, for me over time is realization of the investment that has been poured into me uh, by the mentors, you know, that we talked about, uh, by the leaders um, throughout time. You know, as you as you rise through the ranks, your ability to impact and to influence others and watch them become successful and serve as a mentor to them kind of fuels that passion. Now I look at it as not only can I do amazing things because of the position for 2CR as a whole, but also... Um, I can start to influence things and, you know, change across the Army and, and be able to have the conversations with some of these CSMs um, and general officers about policy and regulation and everything else change. So that's where the motivation has come. It's easy for me. Uh, my motivation, uh, once I got my uh, life together, uh, it was my, uh, my wife, uh, my family, uh, my children, and last but uh, certainly not least, the soldiers that uh, were under my care. My first uh, team uh, was uh, composed of uh, one kid that uh, from New York City, the Bronx, that uh, was ordered, uh, court ordered to join the military, left a successful business owner now. Uh, my other soldier was a three-time uh, marijuana offender, placed under my care, uh, now a successful officer. And the last one was not really a problem child, uh, therefore, he's a sergeant major as well uh, at this point. And, and that's just an example of the first three uh, soldiers that were under my care. All very uh, successful people. Uh, so acknowledging the legacy that is going to be left behind, being cognizant of the efforts that you do day in and day out that will have a high payoff uh, for the Army in the future is uh, what keeps me motivated to keep doing this as long as the Army can have me. I mean, I'll, t I'll tell you, my career has gone in phases, I think. So when I when I was young, I was just like all of the young people that we've got right now, and all I wanted to do is get to war and get my combat patch and my CIB. That's all I wanted, and uh, that's really what made me re-enlist the first time. And as I grew up, what happened was I realized that the Army, the Army needed people like me. I think that's the same thing that I wish that all the young kids – in my squadron realized that how special they are and that their attitudes and their mindset, the army needs them. And so as I grew up even more, got higher in rank, I realized the army had done some amazing things for me and actually transformed me from that kid back in the day that was drinking a lot and getting into trouble and uh, turned me into somebody who had values and I just want to give back. And that's really, I think, for the rest of my career, they always say, after you hit 20, you're working for half a paycheck. Right. And so, I mean, that's the way that I feel, and I don't care. I want to give back. I want to, you know, I don't care if it's half a paycheck that I'm working for. I want to do whatever the Army needs me to do. Sorry, Major Greer. So, I would say three things. Events that happened throughout my career, the people that I met along my career, and, of course, family, right? So starting with family, just doing something others did in my family, but not achieving the rank that I've achieved now. So kind of like setting that stepping stone for the next generation to kind of take oh, it to wow. an, an, okay. another level. My family's real close. Um, it's it's real important, real important to each other. 
just based on the history of how we came to the United States and, and how everything came about and, and where we are today. That's always kind of like a driving factor on always trying to succeed and be better. Event, positive and negative. Positives, you know, you always want more of those. The negatives, you always want to ensure it doesn't happen to anybody else. I try to take that leadership role to ensure that the things that happen along my career that were truly negative do not happen under my watch. Um, and then when we talk people, I mean, Sergeant Major Pedraza hit on it. The different walks of life that you meet in the Army, I don't know any other job you can meet people like that. I've, I've met it so many good crazy. people, and they've had such an impact on my life. And just I feel my service, you know, I, I'm representing the people that had that impact and I would, and hopefully honoring some of the loss and, you know, and, and the memories um, of these individuals. So, yeah, that's why I do it. Back to you, Sergeant Major Allen. To be honest? Yeah. Uh, well, I hope early so. in my career. You could lie to us. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'll be transparent. Early in my career, I would say lack of education and lack of planning yeah. got me to 10 years in the Army. By the 10-year mark in the Army, I was married with two children. I had to make a decision what I was going to do. And so over the last 10 years, I've educated myself, and I love what I do. Yeah, after you kind of made that decision that this is what you were going to do for at least, you know, the next decade. Yes. Yeah, how are you going to better yourself? You know, I, I, I can relate with that, too. You know, I think that, that that was a little bit of it for me as well. And uh, it's just going to continue to grow from there. Well, I don't know if we've necessarily answered the questions of, what does a SAR major do? So let's go around the horn and uh, everybody can say, what do you feel you, know, you do as a SAR major? All right, I'll start. So two words, get results. That's what a SAR major does. We get results. Regardless of what the, the mission, task, we get results. As a, as a SAR major, a big piece of what we do is influencing. Influencing soldiers, influencing other leaders, officers, the younger generation to better themselves, to be well-trained so they can engage the enemy and eventually assume your position one day. That's awesome. Good luck. Yeah, I, I agree with him wholeheartedly. I think uh, to just to add on to it, Sergeant Major, doesn't matter where he's at in the rank of Sergeant Major, should always make sure that he's focusing on what non-commissioned officers are supposed to be doing. Right. And that's training individuals and crews and teams. When you're doing the things at Echelon that you're supposed to be doing, it should always be focused on how am I shaping this organization to make sure that individuals and crews are being trained to standard. And everything else that you do, all the advising that you do to your commanders, uh, all the influencing that you're doing around your organization should always come back around to making sure those individuals and crews are being taken care of and being trained. Awesome. Senior enlisted advisor to the commander. I'm the voice of the commander and the soldiers. Yeah. So I make sure that everything is resonating, you know, up and down, and that the vision and influence is spread out across the whole formation. Sergeant Majors only exist in our Army today to take care of soldiers and their families and uh, to have their best interests at heart. I am the dream killer at the planning sessions that occur in our squad. I wasn't sure where he was going with that one. Okay. <laughs> As great ideas come up by some officers and other people that I'm just shooting holes in their stuff, and it's with your best interest at heart. Of course, improving the organization, of the training, maintaining traditions for the Army. At the end of the day, we come out of those sessions with the best possible solutions to the problems that we have. What's the most finite item that, that exists in our Army today is time. Uh, the the items and taskings and requirements, that's a mountain. That's a mountain we won't we won't uh, ever climb completely, but uh, we are trying, and I am your voice up there, um, fighting for you and your family to have a balanced life, uh, better than I did, like Sergeant Major Guerrero mentioned, with uh, education, training, and development, like Sergeant Major Rose mentioned climbing towards the, the vision and goal that the squadron commander has uh, because I am his aide to get us there, as Sergeant Major Allen said. That's good, man. All right. With all with all of that in mind, and every single one of you had, had great points, but we focus on the climate, the culture, the training, the good order and discipline. And then I would also underline all that, 
for me personally as a leader, my mechanism to achieve all that and the command's uh, mechanism to achieve all that is through leader development. Um, because, you know, the, the interesting thing about being a SAR major um, is, is we were all privates at one point. We were all those lower enlisted soldiers. So just like Sergeant Major Pedrosa talked about, our ability to remember that stuff so that when something is happening or some kind of good idea is coming or some kind of training event, we can play to the lowest common denominator and say, yes, but we need to think about it from the soldier's perspective of how this is going to be interpreted. We've got to make sure that it's realistic training and quality training. Um, you know, So here's how we kind of get after that. And that leader development is a portion of that through the, the mechanism of the development of the SAR majors at the squadron level, the first SARNs, the platoon SARNs, and all the NCOs that kind of make up the formation. And then also at the same time, the officers as well. Um, as a SAR major, you know, you have a pivotal role in the officer development of our organization. Um, so focusing on all that stuff is, is you know, the, the way we get after that is through that kind of leader development. And the SAR major, you know, at every single level, but especially up at the regimental uh, rebel, or level is the one that sets the expectations and holds the junior leaders accountable to that. Hopefully we kind of articulated to you that SAR majors are people. We always talk to you, come up and engage us, tell us what uh, we're not seeing and what's going on across the formation uh, so that we can continue to make 2CR an awesome organization. I think we'll probably end up doing this again. Got some great questions kind of from out in the force, so maybe we'll look at doing this uh, another time. So I ask you to kind of blow up the PAO's box with ideas and recommendations and questions, not only for this particular episode, if you want to see it again, but then also future episodes. We're always looking for feedback from all the Dragoons of what you guys want to hear about and what you guys want to talk about. We're going to close up this podcast, but before I do, War Eagle 7, Saber 7, Pioneer 7, Muskin 7, and Dragoon 7, signing off.